Welcome back. We are on chapter 23, Biosocial Development in Late Adulthood, our final stage of life. All right, let's begin with a discussion of the theories of aging. There are really just two main theories for why we age and why ultimately we have a limited lifespan. The first one is known as the wear and tear theory, and the second one is known as the genetic clock theory. The wear and tear theory says that our body wears out due to the passage of time, um, exposure to stressors, um, and that these accumulations are what are going to ultimately cause us to start winding down. The genetic clock theory says that, sorry, I forgot to mute my phone, that DNA regulates the aging process. And so um, we have hormonal changes that will cause our bodies to start to wind down um, because these hormonal changes are going to cause us to stop repairing our cells as well as we used to repair our cells and reproducing new cells. So we'll see a longer duration on the turnover, for example, of skin cells. So you may have drier skin as you age. Um, those kinds of, of changes happen. According to the wear and tear theory, because of the accumulation of what, of what are called free radicals, which are the um, waste products from processing oxygen, basically, because those accumulate in your body, ultimately, according to this model, the max age that humans could probably live is about 122 years of age. Incidentally, under the genetic clock theory, because they argue that your cells can only reproduce themselves about 60 times before they lose their effectiveness, your max age is about 122. So regardless of which theory we follow, um, we still have the same basic maximum lifespan um, possible. So that's kind of interesting. We've resulted the exact same number but for different reasons. One, on the genetic clock, it's all governed by your DNA and this sort of how you're set up. Under the wear and tear model, you know, it's really a function of time plus environmental factors. Um, let's talk a little bit about wear and tear specifically and talk about cellular aging. Oxygen-free radicals. I just kind of mentioned that a second ago. So in a normal oxygen ad atom, there is a free radical that orbits the nucleus. There you go. I thought of the word. Those um, electrons can lose their magnetic connection to the oxygen and, and leave the, the nucleus. That sets off a chain reaction in the neighboring cells so that free radicals are released from those. And so ultimately what happens is that the cell membrane starts to deteriorate. And so the cells are going to lose their um, structure, basically. Unpaired electrons um, occur because of energy production. You know, like I was saying, as you eat food and process food, as you breathe, um, all these things that you do to stay alive, um, as you're producing energy from those things, you ultimately are unpairing electrons. These um, free radicals are a waste product of the process of, of energy creation. And of course, you can't really avoid the process of energy creation, right? Like you have to do that. So the free radicals accumulate in your cells and um, there are things you can do. There are antioxidants that help to nullify the effects by binding with the electron. You've probably heard of antioxidants in nutritional things, in makeup, um, things like that. The basic premise is that we want to bind up those, um, you know, free radicals so that they stop harming the cells. Um, actually, something didn't show just now that should have shown. So hold on a second. Let me get that to go away. Okay, now let's go again. All right. So, whoops, there we go. Um, so the antioxidants can capture those free radicals and basically neutralize them. And so that's what antioxidants do for us. So if we follow the genetic clock theory, um, the Hayflick limitation explains why you can only replicate your cells six, 60 times over your lifespan. Um, what they're saying in the Hayflick limitation is that the telomeres, which in this diagram that you're seeing here, um, are the tips of these chromosomes. Every time the cell replicates, those little telomeres get shorter and shorter. And so you have less genetic material on each of the chromosomes each time you re replicate the cells. So that means somewhere between 40 and 60 cell divisions would be possible before this chromosome would be so short that it doesn't carry enough of the um, genetic material to actually give its message. 
So on the genetic clock side, one of the things that they argue is that you can slow aging through calorie restriction um, because calorie restriction will actually slow the number of replications. So you'll actually be replicating your cells more slowly when you're on calorie restriction. Therefore, um, you're still only going to do 40 to 60 replications, but they will occur with more distance between them. And so you won't age as quickly. Here's some data to support the idea of um, calorie restriction, and this is based on mice. The premise being that um, you know mice metabolism would be sort of like humans, except for you have to extrapolate it out to years instead of months. So on the in the green bar, what you see is mice who are allowed to eat whatever they want, and you see that they diet roughly 37 months, something like that. In the blue, you see those who are on a 25% calorie restriction diet, and now they're living to be you know, 40, 41 months, something like that. The pink is a 55% calorie restriction, and you see that they're living past 50 months. And then at 65% calorie restriction, you get a little bit more, a couple more months of life. But I wanted to show you something which is interesting because researchers have found that um, there are individual differences in how much benefit you might get from a calorie restricted diet. If you have a mouse who has a tendency to overfeed when they're given the opportunity for a normal diet, then following the experimentally restricted diet actually does give you really good health benefits and the mouse actually lives a lot longer. Whereas if you have a mouse who already tends to eat moderately anyway at the start and then is put onto the experimentally restricted diet, you get smaller health benefits because you already were having the benefits of the normal moderate diet anyway. Um, they kind of represented that with the number of hearts that are showing over the mouse. So the one who has a tendency to overfeed only has one heart. And then after he follows the experimentally restricted diet, now he has four hearts over him, implying that, you know, he's going to live longer. Um, with the one who eats a moderate diet anyway, has three hearts and then extends their life to four hearts, right, by going on the restricted diet. So this uh, follow-up research kind of gives the impression that, you know, following a moderate diet is probably pretty darn good. It's the overfeeding that's the problem. And um, the other thing that people are looking at right now is do you have to be on a chronically restricted diet or can you do periods of restricting diet and then having a moderate diet in between? Not an overfeeding diet, but a moderate diet in between and get the same kinds of health benefits as you know being on a restricted diet for a long period of time. People point to events like um, Famines, or uh, I'm thinking in particular, if any of you guys are Little House on the Prairie fans, the real, you know, like the book, the books, um, there was a book called The Long Winter that described a, a year where the blizzards shut the town down from like October until May and the town folk almost died of starvation. And a lot of those town folk ended up living well into their 90s. And one argument is that that kind of period of deprivation could reset like the fat deposits in the liver and other kinds of things that can really slow down, um, you know, that can really have an impact on, on aging. And so um, it's not really clear whether you have to be on a chronically restricted diet or if you can alternate between a restricted diet and a, and a moderate diet and get the same benefits. So the research goes on. All right. Now that we've kind of addressed the different theories that govern why we age, let's talk about some stereotypes and prejudice that we hold towards um, people based on age. Um, ageism it would be negative attitudes towards people who are older. Um, you know, I think there are probably equivalent negative attitudes towards people who are younger, like adolescents or young adults. Um, but weirdly, we don't call that ageism for some reason. I think... Um, uh, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, these are groups that it's okay to be biased towards. Whereas when we're older, it's not okay. And so we call it ageism. Um, these are people who are, uh, famous and hold high ranking positions. I know that the woman on the left is a CEO. The one in the middle, I know he's, um, he was a lawyer who sued the city. I'm not exactly sure what exactly happened to Kenneth Taylor. I, I tried to look it up and get more details about his story. I'm not exactly sure what happened. But all of them are um, featured by the AARP as examples of high functioning, um, high status people who have been victims of ageism. And so if you can be treated as a, you know, a doddering old fool when you are clearly not, you can imagine how um, an average everyday person might get these kinds of ageist um, treatments that you know, these high, high functioning people are getting. 
Um, it's considered ageism if you're displaying stereotypes or prejudice towards anyone who's over 40, which I don't mean to be old or anything, but seems kind of young to me, but okay. Um, <laughs> but if you're over 40 and you're being treated differently be because of your age, like for, for example, I know that the guy in the middle was literally told in the interview when he was trying to go for, I don't even know if it was a promotion or just a lateral, really what he was asking to, to change over to. He was told, well, I mean, you don't have that many years left before retirement. Like that's clearly an ageist thing to say, you know, I don't know how much longer you're going to be around, right? Like that's clearly um, ageism. He should be the one to decide how long he's going to stay in that position and things like that. I mean, can you imagine saying that to a um, young woman? Well, I don't know how long it's going to be before you have a baby, right? Because people historically have said that to women, right? Um, it, these are, this is called discrimination when you treat people like that. So ageism is, is, um, Anytime you're displaying stereotypes or prejudice towards people because of their age, elder speak is a way that we oftentimes will talk to older people. Here we have what appears to be, you know, like healthcare professionals and they're being told today you're going to learn a new language and the new language is called elder speak. So egg is eggy waggy and drink is drinky winky and sleep is nighty nighty. Um, basically, elder speak is when we kind of use parent ease that we talked about earlier in infancy, right? Like that higher pitched voice. We speak more clearly. We talk about the here and now, right? Like all of that stuff that we do with, uh, with mother ease, but we're doing it to an older person. Now in the defense of a younger person who adopts that kind of speak, a lot of times it's because they know that the older person might not hear that well. And I do need to speak really clearly. But if you're assuming that the older person can't hear because they're older, that's discrimination, right? That's being prejudiced towards older people. Not all, all older people have hearing problems. Um, the other thing that I would like to add on as elders speak is when you speak to an older person as if they're, as if they're childish. So if you say to that woman in the picture on the upper left, um, if you call her young lady, well, what do you think about that young lady? Well, that's clearly, uh, she's not a young lady and it's a, kind of a dominance thing to say, you know, if you say young lady or you say, um, young man to one of the men, or you say kiddo or any of these kinds of pejorative little, um, diminishing them kind of language, that's part of elder speak also. Um, so it's a style of speech and then it's also the words that are used. A lot of elders accept the stereotypes themselves. And it's kind of hard not to, you know, as people age, a lot of times they'll say, you know, man, I'm having a lot of trouble remembering people's names. And honestly, when they were in their twenties, they probably had equal amount of difficulty remembering new people's names, but they didn't think anything about it. It didn't seem like ominous, but now that they have gray hair, they're saying, well, I mean, I should do better at this. I should be able to remember new people's names. Um, so they kind of sometimes think to themselves, this might be a sign that I am losing it or whatever. Um, there was an old episode of the, Sim of the Simpsons where, um, the, this older guy go, goes into the, um, elementary school and at night they were holding a whole bunch of different kinds of, um, community workshop types of activities that you can, um, join. And he comes in and he said the the receptionist goes, Oh, are you here for um, coping with senility? And the older guy goes, no microwave cookery. He walks in the room and he comes back out and he goes, coping with senility. Um, you know, the idea that, you know, he was being treated kind of prejudicially, right? Like just because he's older, he's clearly here for coping with senility. Um, and then of course he reacts, no, I'm not. I don't want to fulfill that stereotype. I'm not coping with senility. And the truth was he was there for that. Um, of course, it's a cartoon. It's intended to be a joke. But I mean, the idea that an older person would internalize, um, what people expect of them, it could cause them to limit their own opportunities where they're like, well, maybe I am vulnerable and I shouldn't go out after dark, or maybe I would fall down, or maybe, um, you know, and they start to adopt all these stereotypes that they've heard their whole lives about the kinds of things that happen when people get older. And it might cause them to sort of voluntarily limit their own opportun opportunities. And they also can display stereotype threat where there, we talked about this before, this idea that, you know, I know that people hold this attitude about people in my group. I'm so busy trying to show that I, that that would be wrong, that I really am not going to fulfill that stereotype, that I take some of my cognitive effort away and inadvertently end up supporting the stereotype. So I really do forget something when I know I have a really good memory and that I don't fulfill the stereotype, but I was distracted and now I couldn't remember what we were talking about or whatever. Um, 
So because of stereotype threat, they might actually accidentally end up fulfilling stereotypes in front of other people that then now say, see, it's because this is how old people are, right? And, they, and then that stereotype persists. Um, so one of the benefits of taking a class such as this one is that hopefully you'll walk away in the end with maybe a more positive attitude about um, how well people on average maintain their faculties, maintain their health, maintain their vitality, and so on. And hopefully that'll help to reduce um, stereotyping. All right, I think we'll stop here and we'll move in the next segment to the gerontology uh, topic. So I will see you in the next video.